Okay, uh, I have 12.01 and I think we'll get started. So thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, my name is Matthew Reitzel, the Manuscript and Photo Archivist with the South Dakota State Archives. And October is Archives Month. So we always try and do a few things to highlight some of our collections uh, in the month of October. Um, we're doing this uh, on Zoom. It's something we've never uh, done before, I guess, but we are recording it and we'll plan to show it uh, on our the State Archives uh, YouTube page uh, in the very near future. Um, and if you do have any questions, the chat feature is uh, available and I'm gonna try and stop a few times along the way here. And um, if you have any questions, um, we'll look at those. So again, this title uh, of the presentation is the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge Pier, Fort Pier, a photo essay. So let me get this started. Okay, so um, a lot of times the State Archives, one of the questions I get is, what's your favorite photo or do you have any interesting photos or something related to my favorite photo? And this is probably probably one of them, uh, certainly in the top 10, probably top five, could even be top three, I guess, but it's just a bunch of guys working on a steel bridge. It's very interesting. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting faces, I guess you see on here. It looks like the uh, people in charge with the ties are kind of, down at the bottom here, I guess. Those must be the men in charge, but it's just an interesting photo to look at, especially dealing with uh, railroads and railroad history. We did use this image uh, a few years back um, for Archives Month. The title was A Bridge to the Past, which is a very good title and a good photo. Uh, and with that, October uh, is Archives Month in South Dakota. The theme we have for this year is history as it happens. And there's a lot of different uh, history going on right now, and a lot of it is COVID-19 related. The State Archives um, does have a documenting COVID-19 in South Dakota website, um, and the, the images that you see here on our poster came uh, from there. Uh, and we're still asking people to send us information on our website, and you can find that um, documenting COVID-19 in South Dakota link at history.sd.gov slash archives. And some of the photos here, this, uh, the big one on top, that's from Wall. You can see Wall Drug in the background and uh, nobody is there, uh, which is an interesting picture to send us. Uh, on the bottom left is some empty shelves, which a lot of us saw at different periods of time uh, in the state. And then we have a teacher here. It says, I missed my fourth grade students, um, which a lot of teachers did uh, towards the end of last year. And then we have a woman here making some masks. So um, history as it happens, uh, and if you have any additional, like we said, COVID related images or anything like that, feel free to visit our website for documenting COVID-19 in South Dakota. Uh, and then also next Wednesday uh, at noon, Virginia Hansen, um, of the South Dakota State Archives will be doing a genealogy question and answer session uh, on our Facebook page. So be sure to check into that as well. So there's gonna be two online sources I'm gonna be talking about uh, with this presentation. Uh, the first one, <clears throat> is on the South Dakota Digital Archives, uh, which you can see here. And again, you can find that on our website, thehistory.sd.gov slash archives, or you can just go Google or uh, any search engine, South Dakota Digital Archives, and it'll bring you here. The main ones we're gonna be using are from the photo collections up here, and also the map collections. We have almost 70,000 photographs uh, currently online on the South Dakota Digital Archives and about a thousand maps, uh, which you can search for there. We also have some manuscript and government collections, as long as land survey field notes, and the Wee Yohe was an early publication uh, of the State Historical Society, so you can search for those as well. And then the other one we'll be talking about is uh, Chronicling America. Um, this is a project with the Library of Congress. Um, you can also find links to that on our website currently. There's about 80 different newspapers from over 40 South Dakota towns. Um, all of that is pre-1923, um, but it is viewable and also searchable uh, online as well. And we'll show a couple examples of that uh, in the presentation. So this is the bridge itself uh, across the Missouri River between Pier and Fort Pier, uh, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge. Um, the 2000, 
200 foot bridge is a multi span pin connected Pennsylvania through truss design with steel superstructure. The bridge is set atop seven Ortonville granite piers, and there's actually an eighth pier uh, further out in, wa in the water. Um, the Pennsylvania design was for long span applications requiring heavy, heavy carrying capacities, such as railroads and railroad cars. Um, the second span, uh, which in this photo here is kind of right in the middle. This second span um, is a swing span that would rotate open to allow passage of high clearance boats. Uh, the swing span itself no longer functions, but for a time, uh, the swing span could be opened to let boats in. I, when I reference it, I always say the part of the bridge that looks like a Hershey's Kiss kind of in here, but I've had to kind of modify that, I guess. It's like a Hershey's Kiss that's been put on a peanut butter cookie that's too warm and the top kind of squinches down a little bit. So that's the specific uh, description of that. Uh, and then this is the photo album. We're gonna be using a number of images from this photo album. This is in the collections uh, of the South Dakota State Archives. And to me, it's a real historic gem. It basically has over 50 uh, photographs showing the construction of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge uh, over the Missouri River. Um, unfortunately, we have no provenance uh, to this photo album. And provenance is a fancy uh, archives and also museum term where we don't know the history um, behind it, I guess. We don't know who donated it, when it came to the Historical Society. So it could have been in the Historical Society collections for a number of years. Um, and uh, so we have that there. Um, and again, the advantage of this is you can also find these on the South Dakota Digital Archive. So those same two images, the first span there, the other construction seen on the right, you can find those uh, on the South Dakota Digital Archives. One of the advantages um, of this collection is it had this list. So it had, each of the photographs was numbered um, it included a brief description of the photo, and it also has the date, um, which is really advantageous to us because you can then put all that in order and, and see how the bridge was constructed. The disadvantage, and this is something that really has perplexed me, is that the photos are not in chronological order. Usually with photo albums or scrapbooks, things are put in a certain, usually date order, um, so you can just kind of see it as it goes. But this had uh, it has early ones and then it'll jump to late images and then it'll go back to kind of mid construction ones, which is um, very confusing and we don't know why, why that was the case. Um, we also don't know who the photographer is uh, with these images. Um, we can make some guesses, some assumptions. We know which photographers were kind of in the pure area at this time, um, but we don't know who it was and it's possible it could have been a worker with the railroad or someone who wasn't South Dakota at all. So again, um, interesting photo album has some questions about uh, why it was put together the way it was. <coughs> um, so I'm going to have a little background history here uh, before the bridge. Um, this is an image of Pier. This is Pier Street. You can see the Missouri River here in the background. And today in downtown Pier, there's a historic sign on Pier Street that says Pier was a cow town. I think this is the photo they had in mind. <laughs> when they were saying Pier was a cow town. Uh, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad laid tracks to Pier. By 1880, you can see the railroad here and the freight depot is right in this section here. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out is for each of these slides, you'll see some information here down at the bottom and also this number, this 2010 uh, 0112 018 number. That's the identifier uh, for this photograph on the South Dakota Digital Archive. So if you have this number, you do a search for it, it'll bring up this image. Each photograph on the digital archives and map as well has its own identifier number. Uh, so that way, if you're interested in a particular image or map, or you're looking to order a particular image or map, you can include that identifier number and that'll tell us exactly what it is you're looking for. Okay, again, before the bridge, um, how would people get across the Missouri River? This is an image of um, a group of people uh, just walking across. You can see on the back right here, there's people walking. And I don't know if you can see it here, but there's a number of footprints and footsteps in the, in the mud over here. 
And Fort Pier is in the background. You can see the Stock Growers Bank uh, kind of back over here. So one way to get across the river was to walk across, depending on what the season was. Also in the winter, um, the river would freeze over. So there was a lot of stories of people with carts and even automobiles would drive across the river uh, when the ice was, was hard enough. Uh, another way people got across was using pontoon bridges. This is a pontoon bridge coming off the, of uh, Coteau Street. Um, and there was a number of companies over different time periods uh, and individuals who would have uh, these pontoon bridges for crossing the river. Some of the issues they'd run into is the water depth and the speed of the current could create problems with these pontoon bridges. Um, and then they, of course, all had to be out of the water before the ice started to form. So uh, it was more seasonal to be able to use these. And then there was also people who would offer boat crossings <clears throat> of the river, different individuals for making small trips just to Fort Pier. And then there were ferry boats. Um, the three main ferry boats in the Pier Fort Pier area um, were the city of Fort Pier, Jim Layton, and the Scotty Phillip. Uh, this is a P.H. Kellogg photograph of the city of Pier, uh, Fort Pier from August of 1904. You can see all the people kind of lined in here and up on top. They would also haul cattle and horses across the river. We have a number of photographs of Jim Layton in particular, where you'd see cattle and uh, horses <laughs> being taken across the river. <clears throat> uh, and again, this is a, a map that can be found on the South Dakota Digital Archives. Um, for statehood, um, the area between kind of east of the Missouri River and out in the Black Hills was still Sioux Indian Reservation land, which you see that here. Um, I don't remember where I had found the reference and I wish I had kept it Remember, but there was Kind of an early history um, of railroads in South Dakota and it mentioned how um, both the Northwest Chicago Northwestern and the Chicago Milwaukee made a gentleman's agreement that they wouldn't cross the Missouri River. Um, well that was because it was Sioux Indian Reservation land. Um, so they probably couldn't cross it if they wanted to. Um, and then another reason, another issue I guess that was going on is there we didn't know for sure where the state capital was or where it was going to be. So there were a number of state capital fights in 1889. There were multiple towns that fought to be the temporary capital. And you can see this map here, Pier for the capital from 1889. Um, and then again, soon after in 1890, there was a vote between Pier and Huron to be the permanent capital, which Pier won. And then from 1890 to 1904, every legislative session, and they would meet every other year, there would be some bill or some talk about we should figure try and have another vote of where the capital is going to be um, until 1904 the final one between Pierre and Mitchell which Pierre again won this photograph up on top has his banner vote for Mitchell for the capital um, which you can see here so then we knew where officially finally the um, state capital was going to be and then once that happened uh, as this uh, article says here from the Peer Weekly Free Press, uh, September 1905, the lid is removed. The lid being, um, you know, the Northwestern and the Milwaukee were both going to run rail lines through Western South Dakota to Rapid City. And this is from the Peer Weekly Free Press, which can be found on the Chronicling America website. So um, this is the South Dakota Railroad Commission map of South Dakota from 1905. Um, you can see kind of on the top, here's the Northwestern coming into Pier. Here's the Milwaukee Road coming into Chamberlain. And you have Rapid City out here west with other rail lines. So this is 1904. Um, by 1908, you see both the Northwestern and the Milwaukee have crossed both Old Stanley County and Lyman counties and have reached Rapid City. Um, and again, that's within a four four year time span when both railroads from Western South Dakota. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna stop, stop the share here, I guess, and come back here. Um, again, my name is Matthew Reitzel. I'm the manuscript and photo archivist uh, with the South Dakota State Archives. And October is archives month. So we're using this as a time to kind of showcase some of the collections that we have here at the State Archives. Um, next Wednesday at noon, uh, Virginia Hansen will be doing a genealogy 
question and answer on the State Archives Facebook page. Uh, so be sure to see that. And again, we're recording this presentation. We'll probably put it up on our, we will put it up on the State Archives YouTube page uh, in the future and link to it there so we can uh, see it again. Okay, uh, so with that, let me share my screen here again. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so this is just a brief uh, bridge construction chronology. When I was putting all these photos together, <laughs> I had to stop and think of where exactly we were at in time, I guess, with the photos. So I just created this page to kind of put all that together. So overall, between December of 1905 and October of 1907, was kind of the start and finish of the bridge construction. There was a temporary wooden bridge, which you'll see in a number of images here coming up. Um, that was completed in December of 1905. Um, there was also a Stanley townsite camp, which is located north of Fort Pier, where there are a number of switches, uh, yards, and storage areas, as well as the bridge construction across the river. There was also the need to build 90 miles of railroad track between Fort Pier and Rapid City. So a lot of the materials that were crossing that temporary wooden bridge were constructing the rail line west of Fort Pier. Uh, again, there's eight of the piers. Uh, Pier 1 started September of 1906, uh, so the bridge itself, the superstructure was uh, construction in roughly one year. Steel work began in January of 1907, and the first freight and passenger trains went across the bridge in October of 1907. And uh, interesting trivia point, I guess, is that uh, the cornerstone of the state capitol was laid in June of 1908, so the Railroad bridge itself is older than the state capitol in Pier. So this is one of the first images um, showing uh, the pile drivers uh, on the temporary building the temporary railroad bridge across the river. Um, one other thing to point out is um, you see we have a different number down here. Uh, this is a manuscript collection number for a different photo collection. Uh, even though we have seventy thousand photogra photographs available on the digital archives, there's still a vast array and a number of collections that have not been scanned and have not been digitized. So if you are looking on the South Dakota digital archives for a certain image, a uh, certain town or topic or something like that, and you're not finding what you're looking for, um, it's very possible we have other collections and other photographs that have just not been scanned. Um, so this is the first image uh, in that scrapbook. Um, it's kind of completing the temporary rail bridge across the Missouri River. You kind of see them coming from both sides uh, and meeting in the middle. Uh, this is a good time to also tell you to always be careful uh, with your photographs. Since this is the first one in the scrapbook, it tended to get a lot more damage. Um, you can out see that obviously when you look at the photograph. So always be careful with your historical items, especially photographs. Um, be sure you're handling them carefully. Photographs tend to have that problem because people just pass them around and something will happen to them. So be careful with your photos. Also keep them in a good temperature and relative humidity environment. We generally tell people to keep it around 70 degrees, 40% relative humidity. That tends to be the best uh, temperature and humidity for photographs, but also paper uh, and other materials that you might have. And then light damage. Um, is cumulative and irreversible. So always be careful with your photos, especially if you put them in frames or something like that, uh, that you're not doing actually more damage to them than what you're thinking. So this is a photograph and another news clipping of the first train across the Missouri River to Fort Pier. Um, as it reads here in the article, uh, to be exact to the hour and minute, the first engine of the Northwestern Road reached the opposite bank of the river on the new temporary bridge at a point on Marion's Island at 9.15 a.m. Wednesday, December 13th. Um, the fact is no small historical importance as it marks an era in railroad development in this state, which will continue until the Northwestern has spanned the Western half of South Dakota. So again, another example of a picture that you could find um, a historical item, as well as a newspaper article that can be found on Chronicling America. And again, the importance historically of when you're getting your picture taken, always go 
and stand on top of something and you can get your photo taken. And then you go to the other bank and you stop and stand on top of something and get your picture taken. So this is the first train uh, on the West Bank in Missouri River at Fort Pier. Um, so this is another image uh, from the photo album showing that temporary railroad bridge. And this is approaching the pier side of the river, um, September of 1906. Um, you can see some of the buildings here in the background that will be used for the construction of the railroad bridge. There's a crane up in here. And you also see some men here standing along the, uh, the river. This is where the first pier is going to be built, uh, which we'll show here in a little bit. Uh, and again, more just construction scenes. You can see the, the granite that's going to be used for the piers right in here uh, and other um, materials. So to me, one of the most uh, interesting uh, things about the construction of the bridge are these caissons. Uh, caissons, they're basically boxes that are dropped into the water, go down to the the dirt and muck at the bottom of the river. Um, and then they would sink them down till they got to bedrock or whatever the foundation they're going to. And then they would build the pier on the inside of the box. So here's kind of a description. This one says uh, concrete. Uh, the ones used, or it was concrete construction, the one used for uh, the railroad bridge and pier were wooden. Uh, it was wooden caissons, but um, it is pressurized. And all of the working is done at this bottom part down in here towards the bottom. Uh, you can see how there's water on the side and then they would just dig down uh, and the box would keep sinking down. It would keep sinking down, they'd build up the box um, and work that way. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the caisson was pressur pressurized. There's two photographs here of air compressors uh, from August of 1906 and you can see you also see the temporary bridge here still on the background uh, as well. So, oops, not too far. So this is work on pier number seven. Pier seven is actually on the four pier side uh, of the river, um, but you can see the bottom, this metal bottom here, and it's kind of a wedge down the bottom and it has these metal clasps here. We'll point those out a little bit later when they're starting to build the caisson um, construction. So you can kind of see from this photo how those caissons were started. And then, like I said, you just basically are building a big box. Uh, and you can see the wood beams being brought in by the crane, and they're slowly building up uh, the box and the caisson for the construction. The first time I saw this photograph, I didn't know what in the world I was looking at. I didn't know where, where it was coming from. I thought maybe it was upside down or something in the photo album. But um, going back to that previous image we saw with those metal clasps, you can see them here. So this is the bottom uh, of the caisson. Uh, this is the top, I guess, and all the work would be done in here. So these, the bottom of the box would hit the ground and the workers would just be down in here in this pressurized area and would dig out all the muck. And like I said, the box would just slowly um, start to drop till they got to where they wanted to go. And then once they were at the bottom, you can see the, the Ortonville granite here starting in the, um, the first pier as it's being built up um, within the case. Um, another collection we have of items, this is not on the digital archives, but it's another collection of maps we have show some of the schematics and details uh, of the bridge. And this is showing um, how those piers were built. Um, so you can see the top of the pier here um, and it's going down uh, and the wooden uh, caisson that is surrounding it. Um, according to these schematics anyway, um, of this whole um, pier, roughly 10 feet of it would be above water. There'd be 20 feet um, of the pier that would be underwater. And then another 48 feet that is down into the mud and the muck, I guess. So whenever you look at the bridge, um, here between pier and four pier, only about, um, well, I should say less than half of it is actually above water. Uh, a good chunk of it is actually underground uh, and built into the river. So the caisson itself, uh, its size was roughly 24 feet by 66 feet, which is roughly the size 
uh, of a volleyball court. Um, it's not exactly this, the same size. It's a little, it was a little more narrower and a little longer than a volleyball court, but it was about that size. So if you can imagine a box about the size of a volleyball court sinking down into the Missouri River to help uh, build these piers, it's rather fascinating. And this is just another close up uh, of that. You see the piers or the, the wood construction here. And it mentions the six feet. That's about as tall as I am. So all the space they had at the bottom of this caisson was uh, six feet, which must have been uh, not fun to work in, I would assume. And again, it was a pressurized uh, area. And again, this is the this part we're seeing right in here in this schematic is this photograph, of the bottom of the caisson in there. Uh, and then one other note uh, I noticed here, it mentions the high water elevation at the time. And it also makes a note that the high water due to ice gorge of 1881. So there was a major flood in this area, 1881, all along the Missouri River. So historically they knew the highest the river had ever been, and they decided to build the bridge higher than the highest uh, that was on record. And then this is a photograph of the uh, completed pier. This is uh, Pier 2 from January of 1907. Uh, one other thing to point out, it has this wedge shape here, uh, kind of to the right or the left. This was meant to um, do one or two things and they're both concerning ice. Either if uh, ice was coming down the river, it would either break it in half or it would have it veer off to the side so the ice wouldn't be directly hitting uh, the piers themselves. So when you see that little wedge shape uh, on the piers today, uh, that's what they were, what they were meant for. Um, so yeah, once again, um, my name is Matthew Reitzel, Manuscript and Photo Archivist with the South Dakota State Archives. Uh, October is Archives Month in South Dakota, so this is an opportunity for us to show off uh, some of our collections and let people know uh, kind of what we have. A reminder that next, next Wednesday at noon, Virginia Hansen will be giving a genealogy question and answer session on our Facebook site, so be sure to uh, check that out. And then this presentation is being recorded and we will have it on our State Archives YouTube page uh, in the near future. So here you can see the starting uh, of the ironwork of the bridge superstructure itself. The pier is completed here and now they're starting to, to run the iron across and making the, the superstructure of the bridge. Um, this is another interesting photograph for a few reasons. Um, one, and again, uh, this is March 11th of 1907. You can see all of the ice that's along here on the river. And there's a few men here in the background, so you can kind of gauge the size of some of these ice chunks uh, that were in the Missouri River at the time. Something we don't see a lot of anymore, especially this amount of ice and the thickness of the ice. The temporary bridge, which is running across here to the left, uh, a lot of it has been taken out. Um, so some of that uh, material was maybe lost <laughs> because of the ice. And then this round pier, this is actually the pier that the swing span sits on top of. Um, so you can kind of see the other piers in the background here and kind of which way the bridge is gonna run. As I, as I mentioned, the, the image before, this was March 11th. This is March 19th. So about eight days afterward, all the ice is gone. The temporary bridge has kind of been put back and under work. So uh, even though it created kind of a calamity uh, for the bridge, they were able to put all that back together within eight days and all the ice was gone. So again, here's the first completed bridge span uh, from March, 1907. And again, this is another one of those uh, schematic drawings of the the third pier, the one that has the swing span on top of it, and you can see the caisson is more octagonal shape as opposed to the big square. Uh, and then this is the top of that pier. You can see some of these gear teeth uh, around here where it would move the swing span, and also some of the uh, wheels basically that are on here on the bottom, which would cause it to turn. And it's kind of hard to see, but there is a man <laughs> here up against part of that, which is kind of just interesting. He blends in there 
one pretty easily. And again, with the scrapbook, it's just you're, you can see how you're going through the construction of the bridge. This is showing the swing span mostly completed. This is by May of 1907, and they're just slowly making their way um, across the river. Uh, another thing to always keep in mind, whenever you're looking at historic photographs, um, there's the thing in the foreground, which usually they want you to see, but there's also the information in the background. You can see some houses back here on the left. You can also see the old Hughes County Courthouse here in the background. Um, so you can find other little um, tidbits and snippets of history by just uh, looking in the background. Um, so this is a photograph of the railroad entering Phillip, South Dakota. Um, as I mentioned previously, not only did they have to build the railroad bridge uh, across the river, but they had to build the railroad track from Fort Pier to Rapid City. Um, so the railroad reached Phillip uh, from the Fort Pierce side in May of 1907. Uh, the last spike connecting the two lines was driven on July 9th, 1907 at 5, 10 p.m., four miles west of Phillip. Um, and then the next day, the first train went through from Fort Pierce uh, to Rapid City. So again, another interesting piece of uh, historic trivia, I guess, is that 90 mile section of railroad between Fort Pierce and Rapid City was completed before the bridge between Pier and Fort Pier was completed, which is just kind of an interesting uh, little tidbit, I guess. And again, another picture of the bridge. You can see the, the third span is being completed. Again, this image is not from the scrapbook um, or the photo album that we've been showing, but it is just another image uh, of the bridge itself as it's going along through its construction. Uh, this slide um, I've been labeling as a injustice to panoramic photography. This is a panoramic photo, which doesn't work very well in uh, PowerPoint slides, um, but you can kind of get the feel of this uh, image. Panoramic photographs are, are ones that are maybe six or eight inches high, but then they could be anywhere from two or three feet wide. They're the big wide panoramic photographs. Um, and there's, there's often two questions. I tend to get being the manuscript archivist here uh, at the State Archives. The one is, you probably already have this. And the second one is, you probably don't want this. And I remember the gentleman who came in with this photograph and it was in a frame and he asked those questions. He said, you probably already have this and you probably don't want this. And I said, no, we do not have this. And we would very much want to add it to our collection. So, um, and we only, as you can see here on the bottom, uh, the accession number is H2014, so we only received this six years ago, uh, which was generally compared to items in our collections very recently. So um, it's another good thing to point out that there are still historical items and materials out there uh, that people have, and we're always interested in at least knowing um, if they exist and if people want to donate them, we're always happy to take a look because it might be something um, that we don't have and also something that we would like to add to our collection. Um, this is a little more of a close-up view of that panoramic photo. Uh, and again, looking in the background, there's no Oahe Dam back here, which is just kind of interesting to look at. Um, and then the operation house for the swing span was located in this wooden structure right here on top of the bridge. So that's where they would operate the opening and closing of that span. Um, and then this is the other side. Um, of the bridge. Um, and we didn't have a date for this um, panoramic image. There is the photographer's name down here, but it, again, that is not a, a local photographer that we are aware, aware of or even a South Dakota photographer. Um, so we don't know exactly who might have taken it, but we can kind of date this image based on um, how they're coming along in the construction. It's almost complete. You can see some of these wooden pylons are still underneath this section of the bridge um, and you can also see them at this side so we're assuming this image was taken in October of 07 so the assumption is that this panoramic photo was sometime in September or October of 1907 and again this is the uh, we get to a number of firsts uh, going through here quick this is the first passenger train over the bridge uh, at Pier and the date for that was October 14th 
of 1907 is today is October 14th. So we didn't plan that in advance, but if anyone asked, you can tell them we did. Um, so it was 113 years ago uh, from today that the first uh, passenger train crossed the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge between Pier and Fort Pier. So again, we'll go through some quick first here. So here's the first passenger train crossing the bridge. Uh, here's the first train arriving at Fort Pier. So it's the same train, uh, but it's coming to the depot uh, in Fort Pier. And then we have arrival of first train through from Pier to Deadwood, South Dakota. So, so we got the train crossing the bridge, the train at Fort Pier, the train at Deadwood. So again, it's just showing that um, first tend to be photographed uh, quite often, I guess. Um, a few things I just wanted to note uh, before we all end up here. Um, there was a ferry boat specifically built to help and assist with the construction of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge. And it was the W.D. Walden. Um, you can see it here. There's also a barge that they had built in the background, um, which you can see here. And again, from the Chronicling America site, there's a section from the Pure Weekly Free Press talking about the, the W.D. Walden. Um, the Walden will be 135 feet in length and 32 feet beam, which makes it five feet longer and two feet wider than the Jim Layton. The force of boat builders are also making a barge 140 by 30 feet. Again, that barge is at the background here. Um, so with the Jim or the W.D. Walden, again, there's um, more images. And again, these searches were done at the Chronicling America site, looking specifically at the Peer Weekly Free Press newspaper and just typing in Walden. And it brought up all of these um, images in the newspapers. And one other thing of note is this photograph of the W.D. Walden again, we just received in 2018. So it was only a few years ago when we got this particular image. So similar to the uh, panoramic photo I showed you, there's still a lot of people with historical materials out there. And we're also always interested in adding those to uh, the State Archives collection. Um, also, uh, there was a lot of earthwork done uh, in the construction of this bridge. This is um, in both Pier and Fort Pier. This photo uh, is from the Pier side. Uh, and, and for those who have lived in Pier long enough, uh, you'll know there's a steady incline of the railroad. You can kind of see it being built here as it's making its way to the railroad bridge. So this is a 10 horsepower, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three in the back, eight, nine, 10. Uh, it would scrape a scraper, it would scrape the ground. There's a conveyor belt, which you can kind of see here in the background. And all these horse-drawn wagons would load up with dirt and they're all making their way to the end and dumping out their dirt here uh, as the incline makes its way to the railroad bridge. And along the way, it uh, makes a stop at the railroad viaduct. You can kind of see this is some of the uh, earliest construction work of the viaduct. Um, you can see the dirt on this side that they've been hauling and some on this side. Um, so, so again, this photo was dated to May 31st of 1907 uh, when they started working on the railroad, railroad viaduct. And one of the important things to note with some photographs, and when you have a bridge like this or any kind of buildings that you know the date of, you can help to date some of your photographs. So there's a number of pictures of Pier Street and Pier. If we don't see the railroad viaduct, we know, oh, it's pre-1907. If we see it with the viaduct, it's like, oh, it's after 1907. So knowing when certain buildings, usually it's buildings specifically, when you know when they are dated, you can help kind of date your photographs, maybe not um, to an exact date, but at least you can figure out, you know, decade before, decade after, or something like that. Um, this is more of those blueprints, uh, which I've kind of shown earlier, of the railroad viaduct. Um, this one's kind of deceiving, I guess, because they kind of pushed it together so they could show all the different connections uh, that the viaduct shows. This is more of its actual length down here at the bottom. Um, and then again, there's some more photographs of the viaduct when it's completed from both the north and the south side. And um, another thing that was constructed with the railroad bridge was a passenger depot. 
uh, which you can see here, which was located near the viaduct and also had the stairs going up here on the side. Um, and again, doing a uh, chronicling America search for viaduct, it can find uh, little snippets like this where the mayor of Pierre, Mayor Albert, at the time was talking with people to talk about having some kind of viaduct go over Pierre Street instead of having the railroad um, go through one of the main uh, roads in Pierre. And again, you can find both of those things uh, online. And then of course, the main thing the viaduct is known for is being one of the greatest semi catchers in the history of South Dakota. Uh, it actually has its own uh, Facebook site, which you can go find. I think it's, I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um, but there's been a lot of things that have run into that railroad viaduct. Um, and as, as most people say, it remains undefeated. Um, but this was not solely a modern problem. Um, this was a image we found from the Capitol Journal in August of 1968, where a semi truck stuck under Pier Viaduct today. So this has been happening for at least 50 years, uh, if not longer. Um, so I want to end this presentation on uh, three three quick notes here. Uh, this is, uh, if you've ever seen a photo of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge, it might have been this postcard. Uh, this is an R.L. Kelly postcard view uh, of the bridge. And of course, what's notable about it is the span is open. You can see the span is open. Ferry boat is making its way um, through the river. So the past is filled with a number of historic ironies and at least I find this somewhat ironic, is that the bridge design itself, the railroad bridge design, accommodated itself to the very thing it was meant to replace. Okay, so we have these ferry boats going back and forth, hauling people, hauling cattle and horses across the river. Well, now we have this railroad bridge, which is going to haul those same things across the river, but now it's going to be by the railroad. But the bridge itself, uh, when they designed it, they decided, well, we got to make sure we can still get ferry boats and things through, which I just kind of, um, but, and it didn't completely replace ferry boats because ferry boats existed for, well, in Pier until I guess the 20s when the highway bridge was built, um, but pretty much everything was being hauled by a railroad, um, and that was what the bridge was for. Um, so this is, um, this is kind of interesting. Again, this was a photograph of a buffalo skull, uh, skull found under 20 feet of glacial drift. And the photo was taken on November 3rd, 1906. This is a photograph that was in the photo album. Um, and on the right is a peer weekly free press story on, this, on the same skull or at least group of skulls. So back in the day, if um, you were interested in Buffalo Skulls, you would have to know that this photo album uh, existed, that this image existed. Um, you would have to physically be at the South Dakota State Archives. Um, we would bring the photo album out to you. You would look at it and find it uh, with the caption, which was included, which was again, a great thing with this photo album. It would have the date. So you could think, oh, maybe I can look in the newspaper and see if I can find something. So you'd have to go again at the State Archives pull out one of over 17,000 reels of uh, microfilm newspaper, load it onto the reader, look with your eyes <laughs> on the microfilm and try and find this specific article. Well, since the photo was on the digital archives and the newspaper article was on Chronicle America, you can go to either of those two places, type in Buffalo Skull and it'll bring up the image or you can type in Buffalo Skull and it'll bring up this newspaper article. So that's just kind of showing the ability of us to increase the access to our collections. Um, you can look online in South Dakota, the United States, throughout the world. If you type in Buffalo Skull on either Digital Archives or Chronicling America, it'll bring up these two items. And then the last thing, um, this is another photograph of the bridge. Uh, and again, the swing span is open when you look at it. This is uh, one of over 2,800 uh, glass plate negatives from the Gustav Johnson collection. Uh, these were negatives that were in our vault. They were donated to us in 1992. Uh, Gustav Johnson was a photographer uh, in the Philip area and uh, most of them date to the late 1900s to 1920s. 
about in that time frame. So these were just back uh, in our vault for a number of years at the state archives. Um, because we had uh, the South Dakota Digital Archives, we applied for and had received a grant to specifically scan glass plate negatives. Uh, and this is one of the collections that we did. So all those glass plates, uh, for the longest time, we didn't know what exactly was in them. We knew a few of the images and there had been books published uh, about Gustav Johnson. So we, we kind of knew generally what was in there, but it was through that grant, through the digital archives that we made these images available uh, and searchable online. So if you go to the digital archives, type in uh, Gustav Johnson Pier, it'll show this photograph. It'll also show a picture of the uh, Capitol building and some other images around here taken by Gustav Johnson. So we're able to use the digital archives and make some of our more hidden images uh, more accessible and available to researchers who are looking for them. Um, and with that, so that is uh, the end. Again, um, the plan is to, uh, uh, we are recording this and that we will put this on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, again, October is archives month. Um, it's a chance for us to kind of showcase some of the things we have in our collections and explain to people uh, the different things that we do. Next Wednesday uh, at noon, Virginia Hansen will be giving a genealogy uh, question and answer uh, session on the State Archives Facebook page. Be sure to check that out. Um, and I think that is all. So for those who are here, thank you for watching and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.